What we're going to do now is we're going to light a smoker. Beekeepers use the smoke to, uh, to calm down the bees. It also masks all the chemicals and the pheromones that are going on, uh, masks the attack smells. So I think, I think we're ready. Caught my first swarm in 1947 in a dynamite box up in uh, up in Forest County, and I've kept them off and on ever since. Guess I'm about ready to do battle here. <laughs> now let's take a look here. Bees at the front of the hive are guard bees, and if I do a little puff of smoke here and a puff of smoke there. You can hear them buzz a little bit, and the guard bees all go into the hive, and they're going to gorge on honey. Now the bees glue everything together with this uh, sticky stuff called propolis. Propolis has a lot of medicinal properties in it. If you chew on it when you have a sore throat, it, uh, it numbs your throat. So here's the queen right here. What she's doing right now is she's wandering around, and she's looking for a cell that's empty so she can lay some eggs. And that's her primary job, is to just lay eggs in the hive. And as she wanders around, you'll see different bees will come up and they'll start to touch her and they'll get her smell and they'll pass that smell around inside the hive. And every bee in the hive has to get her smell every 45 minutes. If it goes for more than 45 minutes and they don't get that queen smell, then they know that something happened to the queen and they have to raise a new queen immediately. Here we see capped brood. This is the pupa. We can get the bees to move away by just touching, tapping them on their back shoulders. The brood are the babies. And you can see how this is a solid pattern. So we call this a nice brood pattern. What a shotgun pattern is when there's only capped brood here and there, where there's a lot of empty holes. Yeah, these, these are brood cells right here. And uh, the shotgun effect of empty cells may be indicative of something else too. And normally that should be that should be pretty solid. Most of the bees in the hive are worker bees and the worker bees are all females. Some of them go in and do house cleaning. Uh, some of them feed the, the young babies. Some of them make wax. And here's another another cast. This is this is not a worker. This is one of the boys. This is a drone. The drones don't do any work in the hive. In fact, most of the time they go around and beg for food from their sisters. It's just like with humans, um, they like to be fed and only think about sex with uh, the queens. You can see the drone is bigger, has these bigger eyes and doesn't uh, have a stinger. There's a professor in Germany that has developed IQ tests for bees. And for certain tests, the individual bee will outperform a dog. Okay. It's really impressive what the bees can do individually and certainly as a colony. It's a super organism. They don't, they're not this intelligent so that they can enjoy art and opera, you know. Uh, being this intelligent is essential for their survival. They work a field systematically. They have a language. Uh, um, a bee finds something attractive on that field, comes home to the hive, shares this with the other bees, does the famous uh, figure eight dance um, uh, to tell everybody in the hive where to find this good stuff, and they're all going there. They don't care what uh, is blooming along the way, they finish that job. What we can see here, this is capped honey, 
And then this is nectar that they're in the process of turning into honey. And the way they make honey is they bring the nectar in and they start to fan it. And they have to evaporate all the moisture out of the nectar. Now what we have here is a, a frame of honey left over from last, last fall that the bees haven't used yet. But when they get into rearing a lot of brood, they'll, they'll use that up very quickly. When we want to extract the honey, we would take this frame, if it was all completed like this, and then I put it in a centrifuge and spin it. We're in the middle of um, extracting honey here. These are the frames where uh, I've just extracted some honey from. In my particular case, I spent um, almost 14 years in the high-tech industry in Silicon Valley. Uh, doing venture capital, looking at um, financial markets, at business models. And so what I bring to the um, beekeeping community is um, a good understanding of um, the motivations uh, behind uh, corporations and their products. I've been in Washington a lot in my life because I've served as president of the American Beekeeping Federation and I've worked with I've worked with EPA on getting chemicals approved with chemical companies to get chemicals approved for mite treatments. My name is Jim Bob, and I was the president of Montgomery County Beekeepers and the president of the Pennsylvania State Beekeepers Association. And currently I'm the chairman of the Eastern Apiculture Society, which represents all the beekeepers east of the Mississippi, from Ontario down through, uh, down through into the Caribbean. We think of honeybees as being important for honey, but that's only a byproduct. The real value to agriculture is pollination. Apples, peaches, pears, cherries are not native to the United States. There is not a native pollinator here that will pollinate them. Most people don't realize that the honeybee itself is a non-native species that was brought over by the Europeans. When they brought over most of the European crops or Mediterranean crops that, that we depend on, it is very good at pollinating particularly apples, fruit trees, and, and many of the crops that we rely on. Um, and it's easy to manipulate. You can, you can move those colonies where you want them and create large numbers of them. Um, so it's very convenient for, for agriculture. You're looking at about 15 to 16 billion dollars worth of crops a year in this country that the honeybees are responsible for. One out of every three bites of food that you put in your mouth, you know, comes from something pollinated by honeybees. There were so many bee colonies kept by people that a farmer, uh, with the exception of very few regions, didn't have to worry about pollination. Bees were just there. Beekeepers are good at what we do. I mean, there's a lot less of us than there was 10 years ago. There's a whole lot less of us than there was 20 years ago. And if you go back 40 years ago, I mean, we're just a fraction of what we were. I mean, today there's probably less than a thousand commercial beekeepers left in the United States. You know, a hundred years ago, you had uh, about four million bee colonies, is what the estimate is, um, in Germany. And uh, now we're down to about 800,000. Know? And um, so now as beekeeping is de in decline, uh, pollination is not something that is, just happens everywhere. Bees are not as healthy as they used to be. The environment is not as good as it used to be. Uh, the, I can maintain colonies only by constantly splitting them and putting new queens in. And I've heard other beekeepers say that that's the only way they, they're staying in business now, too. Well, I can tell you what happened a couple years ago uh, when, our, when we had the 50% bee losses in the wintertime. Um, when it came time for the blueberry pollination, the apples, um, everybody was calling and trying to find bees. Most of the apple orchards that had their own bees, they lost them all. In a normal thriving hive, this would be nearly solid. They're definitely, they are definitely weak. The most challenging part um, for um, a bee colony and the beekeeper managing it is um, getting the colony healthy for the winter. This one is very weak. And strangely enough, it was the strongest colony going into winter. If something bad happens during the summer, you don't necessarily uh, notice anything but um, 
uh, it will uh, show up um, in the winter losses. No new brood, and from what I can see, there are no, uh, no eggs or anything being started. This time of year in a healthy, a healthy colony, those should be practically solid with, with the brood. In the past, um, a good winter was uh, if you lost um, maybe 3% of your colonies, you know? and the bad winter was if you lost 10% of your colonies. Years ago, bees without, with very little maintenance would remain healthy here, and uh, I rarely had losses over the winter of 15%. Now I always have losses in the range of 30%, and this past winter it was 40%. By 2006, huge numbers of bees were dying simultaneously on a global scale. Worldwide, many bees acted in the same strange ways before they died. The United States lost half of its bee colonies. In Germany and France, losses reached 40%. Canadian beekeepers lost half of their colonies all in the span of a few months. Despite the huge losses, few honeybee bodies were found. This strange pattern was new. Everyone was losing bees, from small hobby beekeepers to the largest commercial beekeepers. By September, late September, early October, we truck all the bees back to Florida from up north here, everything goes back. My son went back to Florida and right after Christmas, calls me on the phone, says, forget shipping bees to California. All these bees we put this honey on, there's something wrong with them. They're just, you know, they're, they're down to a couple hands full of bees. My son gets on the forklift, I light up a smoker, I start smoking these pallets of bees, and after I smoke four or five pallets of bees, I realize something's telling me there's no bees on the entrance, there's no nothing. And I just started jerking covers open and, and, you know, frantically started opening beehives and there's nobody there. I get down on my hands and knees. I mean, we're talking about gravel. We're not on the sand, we're not in grass, we're in gravel. I get down on my hands and knees and literally look for bees on the ground because there's, but there's no bodies. You know, the ground would have been just that thick with bees. You know, if you have a spray kill or something where somebody sprayed you or the mites got you, if you had a mite problem, There'd be dead bees laying out in front of the ground. The brood, the brood that was left behind would be full of holes where the mites were in that stuff. There was none of that. There's no wax moth and there's no small hive beetles. And in Florida, that time of year, the wax moth, if a hive is dying, the wax moth have already moved in. They eat the wax. They're not there. Now wait a minute, there's something strange, you know, weird here. I'm only in the pollination business. I've been taking bees up for pollination for over 20 years. So in the year 2000, over the winter of 1999 and 2000 and 2000 and 2001, I lost a thousand colonies. And now I have about 100 colonies left. By 99, yeah, I was experiencing a lot of die-off. And what, what it was is, uh, it was colonies collapsing in the summertime, which is unusual. The definition of colony collapse disorder is when you have a healthy hive, lots of brood, lots of worker bees, and within a very short period of time, all of the adult bees leave the nest and go somewhere, and all that you're left with is a queen and a handful of young worker bees. You have a large number of capped brood, but, uh, but no, all the adult bees have left. They had a big uh, population earlier, and then suddenly their population had collapsed. There was no adult bees, and the brood then came down with diseases. But here's a hive of bees that should look like the rest of these, but lots of bees flying in now. And uh, yesterday, uh, my son was working these and, and said this is a hive of CCD, and we'll take a look at it. Something clearly happened around 2004, 2005, that uh, sort of served as a tipping point and pushed um, many of the beehives uh, in North America and in Europe over the edge to where uh, all, kind of all of a sudden and inexplicably, the bees would take off in the morning and never come back. There's no, there's no old bees here. These are, all, these are all real young bees, so something's happening the old bees are disappearing. You look at these, are nice little warm looking fuzzy fellows there. 
they're the ones that have just hatched out. They would just disappear. Uh, very, very few of their bodies would be found. Um, and uh, a hive would go from one day seeming, seemingly healthy, uh, full of a few thousand bees, and the next day they're gone. A normal bee lives about six weeks. If you cut three or four days off that bee's life, you're affecting the whole population hive because now the younger bees are having to do older chores, uh, have to get to the field earlier because the older bees aren't living as long to gather honey and nectar. Uh, and so the populations, instead of building up, becoming 30,000 beehives, 30,000, you get a hive like that that probably only got 1,500, 1,500 bees in it. I'm losing bees almost every day. So it's still continuing. And so, and I've helped start new beekeepers each spring, and those beekeepers are having difficulty. Well, the largest beekeeper in the United States, I mean, Richard Aidey and his son Brent, you know, you know, great beekeepers. I mean, if you're running 60, 70,000 hives of bees, you're not, you know, I don't care who you are, you, you got to know what you're doing. Uh, and I stood in their massive holding locations that goes on for miles, literally miles, in two valleys. And uh, uh, literally stood there and looked at the piles and piles of dells. One, out, one outfit there in Pennsylvania a year ago had 1,400 hives of bees and had five alive in spring rows. You know, that's guys out of business. At first, many possible causes were considered by scientists and beekeepers. Honeybee disease like nosema, fowl brood, and chalk brood. Parasites like varroa mites. Stress from moving commercial beehives for pollinating crops. Viruses like Israeli acute paralysis virus. Genetically modified or GMO crops. Cell phone electromagnetic fields. And pesticides used on crops, yards, or in beehives themselves. I said to myself, what, what do all these have in common uh, across the country? And uh, <clears throat> I, at first I ruled out disease because a disease simply does not spread that fast. Uh, disease takes a long time to move around through the country. I brought back here, right here to this warehouse, that was in mid-November, I brought back 30-some dead beehives, or 30-some hives, some of them alive and some of them dead. Penn State showed up here on Sunday afternoon with a whole crew, pulled samples out of this stuff, and within four or five days, basically said, wow, we ain't never seen nothing like this. Of course, early on they were finding promising things like it was the Israeli virus and then it was uh, something else. And a new, new news bulletin would come out and, uh, <clears throat> you know, claim that they'd found the cause of uh, the bee collapse. And then a week later they would discover that uh, it was still going on in spite of, you know, for example, the Israeli virus. Uh, got a lot of press for a while, and then somebody discovered they had some bees frozen in a freezer for seven years, and they had it. So that meant that the virus was already there and hadn't caused problems. Now, adult bees are pretty hardy. The only uh, the only thing that uh, really kills adult bees, well, there are some viruses, but mostly it's uh, nosema, which is a, a gut parasite called a microsporidian. But when they sampled my bees at the university, they didn't find high nosema levels, and we didn't have this new nosema back then, and nosema was always endemic, and I even fed uh, fumadil by times, which is uh, something you can do against nosema. Bees, from an evolutionary point of view, have a relatively simple immune system. They're um, not very able to take care of themselves is kind of the simple way to put it. And so they're vulnerable to uh, bacteria and viruses and, and uh, uh, over the years there have been large die-offs of bees. What we have found is these bees ain't got no immune system. Something's wiped out their immune system. That's like AIDS, you know. I mean, AIDS, you know, is not killing anybody. AIDS is just you know, that's a virus, that, I mean, that's an immune system breakdown, and then you get all kinds of other funguses and, you know, like a people pneumonia and all that kind of stuff that come in and wipe, wipe them out. Many beekeepers now are just 
suspicious about the whole thing. There's a, all we know is there's a big die-off taking place. Well, there is some uh, theory about pesticides, and, and I have been hit some uh, pesticides over the years, but um, I don't know whether there's a, a, a specific element in the pesticides that's causing a problem. It very well could be. A personal friend of mine, Murray Forgraven in, in New Brunswick, that called me in the fall of 2001 or 2002 telling me we got a problem. We got this new pesticide that's basically wiping out my bees. The bees were on clover, had been, been potatoes the year before, and the bees are getting something out of this, this clover, and by fall the bees are dead, are vanishing, you know. But not all the possible causes worked. Honeybee diseases like nosema, fowl brood, and chalk brood have been with the bees for many years. And there are collapsed hives without these diseases. Pests and parasites like varroa mites are well-known problems that many beekeepers already know how to control. Stresses from moving commercial beehives for pollinating crops have existed for decades, and many dead bee colonies were never moved. Viruses like Israeli acute paralysis virus have not spread around the world, and bees with the disease do not exhibit symptoms characteristic of the collapsing colonies. Genetically modified plants are toxic specifically to other insects and are not allowed in some countries that are having colonies collapse. Cell phone electromagnetic fields have been around for long before the initial bee die-offs. By 2005, a new class of pesticide had come to dominate the global market. In December, I started basically spending a lot of time in front of a computer trying to figure out what has changed in agriculture in the last couple years. And the only thing that changed, I mean, major change in, in chemistry in agriculture was the fact that in 2004, 2005, give or take, we started using high levels of nicotinoid systemics in agriculture, horticulture, uh, treating your dogs and cats, uh, you know, the list goes on and on and on. They're a family of chemistry that uh, uh, Bayer, uh, the, the agrochemical company Bayer, a German-based company, discovered and, and brought to market the first one uh, called imidacloprid. Uh, its trade name in the U.S. is Admire. It's what most farmers would say, well, we spray Admire. It's really toxic to insects. It's toxic. It, it interferes with the transfer of nervous synapses in the insect, and very, very tiny amounts will kill the insect, about, uh, so, depending on what source, somewhere 20 to 40 parts per billion is the lethal dose for 50%. But lower doses than that can have uh, effects on the insect. And, and even uh, Bear's own research shows that. It's a synthetic form of nicotine. And one of the things these chemicals do is they stop the insect from feeding. This is imidacloprid, or Admire is the trade name. It's made by Bear. It's the one that Dave Hackenberg is uh, uh, saying is a problem. It is the most used insecticide in the world now. It's just like the landscapers and lawn care people tell you. The only chemicals we got available anymore are the systemics. They have taken all that old stuff that was available pre-2004, 2005, 2006. All that stuff has been swept off the market. The pyrethroid, synthetic pyrethroid, and the organophosphate C treatments that had been used for most of the 80s and 90s, they just weren't working very well anymore because resistance had evolved to those chemicals. And so the chemical industry uh, came up with the idea to switch to nicotinal C treatments. I knew about nicotinoids and systemic chemicals, but you know, we were told these things are safe, that they don't affect adult bees. The plant, when it grows, will take up the substance and it will reappear in the pollen and the nectar of the plant. And so later, when the plant is blooming, we have problems uh, with the bees. The manufacturers say that it doesn't go up into the pollen and the nectar. Other scientists out here that have done their own studies 
are finding high levels of it in pollen and nectar. So you get a cold front coming through for rain for a week, and they gotta dig into that old pollen they got stored away. All they have is that contaminated pollen. These bees are new beehives that were started this spring, and they're doing well. But the minute they start getting into the water and the pollen coming off the corn, and so these bees are gonna get moved out of here and hopefully get moved into an area in upstate New York where we don't have near as much of this. But we still, it's, it's everywhere. I mean, uh, well, it's everywhere. By 2004, there was a substantial share of the conventional corn crop, uh, probably over 90%, where the seed treatment was now a nicotinal, either imidacloprid or clothiodin or thiamethoxam. Thiamethoxam was sold as cruiser, uh, imidacloprid as gaucho, and clothiodin as poncho. And not only had the chemical industry decided that, well, this is a good idea to switch chemistries, they also had a strong reason to substantially increase the punch delivered by the seed treatments. And this is an important part of the story and one that's not known or understood by very many people. At, at this time, the, the biotech companies were coming out with their first genetically engineered seeds to control the corn rootworm. The young corn plant, when it first germinated, wasn't producing enough of the, of the Bt toxin in the roots to stop the feeding by the corn rootworm. So when they realized they had a early season efficacy problem, they solved it by going first to the encapsulation and the timed release of the seed treatment, and then they went to a higher dose. They increased the, the dose of nicotinol, which started out at 0.25 milligrams per seed. They jumped it up fivefold to 1.25 milligrams per seed. And those seeds hit the market in about 2004. By 2005, a significant portion of the corn was planted to those seeds. And I think it peaked around 2006. What it did was it resulted in a higher level of imidacloprid up through the corn plant for longer in the season to the point where the level in the pollen uh, collect, collected by the bees that might be foraging in the cornfield reach toxic levels. We don't have technology capable of measuring it, but it's still high enough to cause an impact on the neurological system in the bee so that it, it can, it has the strength to go out and fly and it can fly, but the, imagine the, the, you know, how fine-tuned that neurological system of the bee is to be able to find that, find its way back to the hive. I mean, they don't, they don't have a roadmap. They don't really see very well. It's a, it's a very fine-tuned uh, way that they relate to their environment. And I think it's that, that uh, feature of bee neurological behavior and performance and, and health that is impaired by the nicotinals. It's not killing them, it's impairing their ability to find their way back to the hive, and that's what causes colony collapse disorder. And that's what's happened to honeybees. Then they lose their memory and they can't find their way home. And I can give you guys, beekeepers, that have ran while the rest of us are all having problems. They're doing fine until they can encounter these insecticides one time. This past winter, citrus. They started using Provado, which is a nicotinoid systemic, this past year for greening. These guys that had, had never had a problem before, where they ran from the woods to the woods and only went to oranges and basically stayed away from all kinds of uh, row crops and cotton and all those things where we're using this stuff, weren't having a problem. But the minute they got the minute they started using this stuff on citrus, they got the same thing going on we've seen in 2000. I have conversations this week with beekeepers in Georgia. 40% of their boxes are showing up empty. Now, in Germany, we had losses of honeybees that were so massive um, 
they, they were beyond uh, anything that had any, ever been experienced here. And um, the connection to a particular insecticide, a particular seed treatment, was so obvious that um, uh, you know, it was impossible to deny. It was um, you know, way over 90% of the samples of dead bees that were sent to the government research lab had very high levels of this particular pesticide. Um, the brand name is Poncho you know, by Bayer. After it became clear that it's certain seed treatments that are causing specific problems, the beekeepers went to court and managed to get some of these seed treatments banned. That was an event that got everybody's attention in the beekeeping community, but also got everybody's attention in the uh, agrochemical industry. The German government basically withdrew the approval or suspended the approval for this particular insecticide and um, all insecticides that are in the same chemical group. Well, Pennsylvania is in the forefront for CCD research, um, primarily because of Dave Hackenberg. Uh, Dave Hackenberg, although he might not have been the first person to experience colony collapse disorder, um, he was the one that raised the red flag and, and Dave is very vocal and so uh, um, he would manage to get both the Florida Department of Agriculture, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and Penn State University working on this on this problem. People have uh, thriving thriving colonies one week and uh, next week they go out to either move the bees or do something and they find they're all gone. Some as high as like Dave Hackenberg lost 80% of his, uh, and we're talking thousands of hives. So when they start opening up dead hives that day, it must have been a bad, <laughs> a bad thing. I wrote a letter, uh, March, February, I guess it was, when I wrote the letter, a uh, four-page letter that some of the scientists told, told me that you know, nobody's going to read a four-page letter, but I wrote, I wrote it to my growers. I mean, 20-some growers that I worked for, you know, whether it's apples, blueberries, you know, pumpkins, melons, or whatever it is. I sent all these guys a letter, basically telling them about the problem, you know, and something's changed. And, you know, here's what I think it is, you know, and I wish you'd work with me, try to limit your use of this stuff. Uh, because the bees that had been, been the pumpkins the year before, where they'd used uh, lots of this stuff, uh, they were history. They were gone. They had used nicotinoids and, and some stomachs. I even had one apple grower call me two days after I sent the letter out. I mean, and he didn't have hardly time to get the thing. Called me on the phone and said, I think I'm part of your problem. I used a sale, which is one of these chemicals, in the middle of apples last year because, you know, my chemical representative told me to. He said, it says right on the label, it's safe to adult bees that you can spray during bloom. And it does say on the, on the information, in, in bold letters, you can spray this during bloom. But in parentheses, behind that, it says, and I had to read this four times myself before I could see it. In, in bold letters, it says, can spray anytime, even during bloom. In parentheses, not when bees are foraging. Now, you know, we've taken this to EPA and said, you know, this, this is false, whatever. And they said, no, not really. It's, it's, it's right. You can spray it during bloom if there's no boy, bees foraging. And it's the farmer's responsibility to know whether or not there's bees foraging, see? So, you know, there's, everybody's got an angle. I mean, you know, the chemical company, EPA, everybody's got an angle to get around this thing. Um, but the interesting thing about this letter that nobody was going to read, you know, according to one of the, I mean, you know, the guy, I asked one of the scientists to pre look at this letter for me, make sure I wasn't putting my neck out and a limb someplace where I didn't need it put, and, and before I sent this out. And he said, it's a great letter, but you're going to lose people's interest after the first per page and a half. You know, well, I guess it didn't lose people's interest because within two weeks that letter was around the world. I mean, I was getting calls from Chile, uh, Europe, 
England, you know, a guy in Chile said, you know, this is exactly what, you know, we're seeing on some things. And, of course, the, you know, the guys in England and, and Italy and, you know, it, I mean, it was amazing. You know, the, the, the Internet's an interesting thing because, you know, something that, you know, you wrote to a couple growers. And I don't know how I get on the Internet to start with because I didn't put it there. But anyhow, um, I mean, within a matter of a couple weeks, there's things around Congress even. I'm, I'm in Congress, you know, three weeks later. And congressmen are saying, oh, yeah, somebody gave me a copy of your letter to your, to your growers, you know. It's pretty interesting what you got to say. At least 36 states in the United States have had colony collapse disorder. These are the same states where large amounts of nicotine pesticides were used. The U.S. state of California has ordered the re-evaluation of 282 nicotine pesticide products. California found nicotine pesticide residues in pollen and nectar to be 20 times more than the lethal concentration for honeybees. In addition to the United States, Canada, Brazil, Chile, Taiwan, India, China, and most of Europe have been affected by CCD. Colony collapse disorder is now a global issue that is threatening the world's food supply. Hi, my name is Dennis Streel, and I'm one of the farmers here at Pennypack. I was talking with the guy who does our bees, and I asked him because I know about the sudden death, uh, sudden hive death syndrome that I've seen. And so I was concerned that we had problems with our hives as well. Uh, to my uh, surprise, he said that he hadn't had any problems with any of his hives. Um, he said it's probably more a, uh, a problem for big uh, commercial honey operations. I can't say either way whether pesticides are a problem, but um, considering that you don't see this problem on organic farms, I would tend to, if I had to make a guess, I would say that that is uh, pesticides and herbicides and insecticides are probably contributing to the uh, problem of the sudden death uh, of hives in the area. We hear of collapses in China, um, collapses in South America, France, Germany have had die-offs. Uh, a lot of the beekeepers there are blaming it on pesticides. Two weeks ago, I was at a bee house just like this, about uh, 30 kilometers away from here, and there were kilos of dead bees on the ground. And that was because um, this farmer had the bee house just like here, next to uh, a flowering pasture. And year after year, everything was fine. And this year, the farmer that owned the pasture in front of the bee house decided to turn it over and plant corn. And the corn was treated with poncho, and the result was dead bees. The farmers are uh, a victim of uh, a policy by the farmers' unions, by the government agencies, by the schools where they're being trained, where they're essentially, by, by the trade journals that they read, everything is about farming with chemicals, you know, um, uh, farming with nature, um, um, how to avoid using uh, chemicals is not a big part of the curriculum. Yeah? And they're kept in the dark about um, the environmental impact, impact on the bees, but they're also, and that is really sad, um, they're kept in the dark about what they're doing to their own health, to do, uh, doing to the health of their families and their farming communities. When you look at all the medical studies um, about cancer rates, sperm counts, you know, um, it's the rural areas uh, that are in deep trouble. I am a farmer and I couldn't operate without the goodwill of farmers. I make most of my income from pollinating for farmers. I, I do uh, blueberries, pumpkins, cranberries, can uh, seed canola, and uh, and, I, and my other yards, which I, which I rent, are all on uh, farms, and uh, I rely on the goodwill of farmers. And, and they're, they're great people, and they're certainly not out to uh, harm the environment. And for them, imidacloprid has a lot of advantages. This is a great boon for them. They just put 
put this chemical on either in the soil or on the potato set, it turns the plant toxic to insects and it's season long protection. All the way across the central part of the country where wheat and corn and sorghum and soybeans and alfalfa are grown, essentially all the soybean fields, essentially all the corn fields were planted from uh, seeds uh, treated with, with nicotinols. Imagine yourself in an airplane flying over any part of the country where a lot of fruits and vegetables are grown. A bee could not travel more than a mile in any of those landscapes without encountering a field of one of these crops that's been sprayed. And, and that would be the case all the way across the country. So the farmer now and the pesticide and, and, and the, the lawn care people and everybody else are doing what they call tank mix. They're taking insecticide in this can, this bottle fungicide in this bottle and something else in another bottle, they dump it all together in a tank and spray it. You know, and it's not his fault. I mean, I, you know, th this is no disrespect for the farmer because he's being told what to do because he's, you know, his livelihood's at stake. Farmers were shocked when they saw uh, what effect what they did had on the neighboring beekeeper. You know, and they the farmers usually did everything um, to try to mitigate. You know, try to you know what can I do better? How can I avoid this? Um, so there is uh, a lot of dialogue between the beekeepers about the farming. What are you planting? What about the pollination? But also, what chemicals are you using? When Bear puts a provision in designed to protect bees on its label. The EPA doesn't review that provision for its efficacy. The EPA doesn't render a judgment on whether it's, it would be effective or whether it would be adequate. It vests the responsibility for avoiding economic damage to personal property on the pesticide registrants. No one anticipated the consequences of that policy in terms of, of bees. But here we are now, we understand that there is a big problem and the federal law really isn't um, set up in a way to deal with it. What does this mean? It means that if, um, if imidacloprid is killing a lot of bees, um, the EPA isn't going to do anything about it. The problem is, though, that inside EPA we have all these folks in management positions that basically got there through appointments or whatever, who, if you trace back their, their beginnings, guess where they came from, all these chemical companies. And we still have a situation where, where um, corporations have their employees sitting with a, in a cubicle or an office inside the ministries that are in charge of regulating them. And I had a, you know, I had a politician, you know, and you know, I'm not gonna, you know, basically make a comment to me one day. You know, he said, you know, everybody in this town's probably been paid off in one way or another by the people that you're that you're talking about because these are the people that donate large sums of money to our re-election campaigns and our PAC funds and so on and so forth. I mean, and the guy was the guy was honest. You know, they want something. They just don't give this big money for nothing. And beekeepers are, are, aren't, aren't the greatest people for giving money to somebody's re-election campaign. The behavior of government agencies here um, is highly suspicious, but when you look at the lobbying environment and the level uh, to which regulatory bodies, scientific bodies, are already corrupted, it's not surprising. You don't criticize uh, a pesticide or a genetically engineered food in the United States. If you work for a public institution, you have to be very careful about what you say or you will find your job in jeopardy. Monsanto and Bayer earlier this year put out a press release announcing that the exact seed treatment that caused the bee die-off in Germany will be the standard seed treatment for all of um, uh, Monsanto's yield guard genetically modified corn. 26 university entomologists signed a statement 
and sent it to the EPA as part of formal comments about genetically engineered corn. And these 26 university corn entomologists basically said, we can't do our jobs of evaluating the efficacy and the safety of these new genetically engineered corn varieties because the companies won't let us do any research on them. The research into the causes for um, for all these bee die-offs, and it's the same in, in uh, all over the world, is where the the, the light, uh, the financial conditions are good to conduct the research, and you're unlikely to commit career aside uh, with the results. And other areas where it's difficult to get funding, where um, some fairly powerful people might get unhappy about the results. Uh, that um, research is, uh, is very limited. We're just not getting anywhere fast. I mean, there's too many people. There's, uh, uh, you get a lot of promises, but you don't, but that's all you get. These are their bread and butter products. Um, Everything is being uh, done to main sh make sure they can continue to market these products worldwide. As, as more scientists have a chance to, to work in the area and become familiar with the science <coughs> and conduct their own research, there becomes in the scientific community kind of a, a, a strength in numbers. We could solve the problem with colony collapse disorder in 12 months by taking strong action against the six or eight pesticides that we know are causing a, a new and significant problem for bees. So what we're saying is, number one, the tests on new chemicals and, oh, of course, um, the, the chemicals that are currently in use have to be retested as well. Have to look at the whole range of effects that are relevant to the health of the honeybee. Take the pesticides out of the risk equation and, and you know, do all the other things that we know is important to keep bees healthy. I think the, the populations will rebound. This is a fight that we cannot afford to lose as beekeepers, but also cannot afford uh, to lose as humans because um, as the bees go, so goes uh, our civilization. So I don't think um, um, failure is an option here. So what can you do? I think it's very important for us to be concerned about our, our honeybees and our native pollinators uh, so that we can have a food supply in the future. And to do this, I think everybody should support honeybee research um, to find out what's causing these diseases and problems. The biggest thing the public can do is, is pick up a telephone, call their politicians, call EPA. Um, you know, I had a, I've had numerous times in my, you know, my years of walking the halls of Congress, I have congressmen and senators tell me I made a vote. I voted on something that I knew absolutely nothing about on one phone call. The public, you know, has got to respond. Not just sitting on their front porch telling their neighbors, you got to call the people that are in charge. In your own area, you should leave areas that are wild and native, probably in the boundaries of your property. Um, Cut down on the use of pesticides. Instead of having large lawns, put in gardens, put in flowers, put in things that, um, that will bring, bring butterflies and, and bees and other pollinators into your area. What I want to convince people of is that their gardens now have a function. The plants in their garden are there for aesthetic reasons, which is all we used to think about, but now they've got an ecological function. Uh, that used to be done by nature out there, but nature's gone, so let's, let's make those plants functional in our garden. And that function is to produce food that supports other living things. When those other living things come in to get that food, we can't spray them. 
with our with our spray cans, or we've we've destroyed the function of our, our gardens. So we need a new mindset about what what the role of our, our gardens and our landscapes are. We're asking the consumer to buy organic products because that type of agriculture creates a healthy environment for our bees. The consumer can do th two things. The consumer can demand food produced that way. The consumer can demand fuel produced that way. The butterflies are going. Uh, all your wild insects are, I mean, it just, we just don't see the ones we used to see. When you ride up and down the road at night, you don't have near the bug problem we used to have on the windshield. I guess if you don't like bugs, it's great, but I'm in the bee mess, and bugs are my livelihood. Let's take a